All right, it looks like everyone's starting to filter in. One more, couple more seconds. All right, I think we're at the point where we can start. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Tunnell. I'm the academic advisor in the math department. And I am here today with uh, Lisa Femularo and Aaron McConnell uh, to discuss you know, the big question, what can I do with my math major? Um, this is uh, something that, that comes up all the time. It's the number one question that I get at open house with high school students and high school student parents. And it is the number one question that I get when I'm meeting with freshmen, sophomore, and sometimes terrifyingly juniors, when I don't know what I'm gonna do with my major. Um, so that's really where this came from. It's, 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 uh, this is the first time we're running this uh, presentation. Uh, both Lisa and Aaron worked, uh, worked hard to put this together. Um, really quickly, I'm going to have them introduce themselves, just uh, so, so you know who they are, and then and then we'll uh, we'll take it from there. So, uh, Lisa, why don't you go ahead and, and introduce yourself first, please? Thanks, Joe, and hi everyone. My name is Lisa Famularo, and I am one of the career coaches in the Center for Career Development here at UConn. Um, I do work primarily on the Storage campus, but I work with students across all different campuses at UConn. And in my role, I do um, primarily focus on one-on-one -on -one career coaching appointments with students, which um, largely entails, you know, helping um, answer any questions you have related to your career, whether it's something as, as kind of as simple as a resume critique, um, or as, as complex as the question that we're here to talk about today in terms of what you want to do after graduation. Um, so I'm happy to be here and hopefully I can share some helpful advice with you before the end of the presentation. And I'm Erin, Erin McConnell. I am a senior applied math and statistics double major. Uh, I volunteer at the Center for Career Development as a CLAS career ambassador. And when Lisa and I were first talking about the formulation of this presentation, I knew that I had the same issue when I was coming in my freshman year wondering what in the world can I do with my math major? And so um, hopefully you guys benefit from this. And yeah, let's get started. Okay, great. So I guess we'll just, we'll just kind of go over really quickly uh, what we're gonna be talking about today. So I, and we'll, we'll start off by just going over the different, different flavors of math that we offer. Um, math is one of, it's a very unique department in CLAS because we have multiple majors within the same one department. Uh, so we'll, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll give very broad um, examples of what, what these majors are about. I recognize many names and many, you know, a couple faces, and you probably heard some of this from me before, but I think it's good just to, just to let everybody know just a, a, a general difference between these six different paths in math. Um, the next thing we'll, we'll do, uh, and this, that's where my, my role will end and all the work that Lisa and Aaron will come into, uh, will, will come into play. Uh, they'll start talking about things like experiential learning. So things like, uh, internship, co-ops, research, things of that nature, things to build up the resume outside of the academic, or academics department, but outside of the classroom. Um, and then next, it, it kind of goes with it. it. It goes from, you know, your major to building your resume. And then, okay, now I have this degree. What, do I, what am I going to do? Am I going to go to graduate school? Am I going to go right to work? And so some examples of those. And then after that, we're going to talk about uh, some some UConn alumni. So who you know, if a couple students, a few students who have graduated, and what are they doing? What are some of the, what are some of their what how what are their paths look like? Uh, at the very end, just some other resources that are going to help you sharpen this focus about you know right now some of you they're just you're just kind of floating out there, I'm not really sure which direction you want to go. So over time, you want to sharpen that focus down more and more, and we'll talk about some resources that will help you sharpen that focus. Um, so the next, so I guess we'll just start off. So. The, there, there are six different uh, areas in math, six different majors in math. Um, if you break them down to BA and BS, it's actually 11 different choices, um, but really it comes down to six options. When we talk about majors in math, we typically take, take math in a big ball and we break it in two and say, okay, there's actuarial science, and then there's applied math, math, math stat, math physics. So it's, it's two separate areas. So there's actuarial science and kind of non-actuarial science. Uh, so let's start with actuarial science. This one is more clearly defined. This one is very different than math, applied math, math stat, math physics, because it's one of the only degrees in all of CLAS that actually points to a career. This degree is for people who want to be actuaries. That is the, the first question I ask someone if they're kind of on the fence about what they want to do. My first question always is, do you want to be an actuary? And if they say yes, then I say, Actuarial science is the way to go. If they say, 
no, not really, then we just leave that behind and that's okay. Um, so there are two different majors. This is a bit confusing to a lot of students. There's actual science and there's actual science and finance. So it's essentially the same degree for the most part. Actual science and actual science finance both are doing the job of getting students prepared to pass society of actuary exams, those industry exams. Those, the, the actual science and finance degree is designed for students who, who came into UConn a bit ahead on their math. Maybe their, their first semester they're already taking multivariable calculus and financial math. Those students, you know, they, they needed more to do. So they created this actual science and finance path, which allows them to do more things with like corporate risk. That's really what that major is for. Um, neither, may, it, one is not better than the other. Uh, you're not at a disadvantage if you have an actuarial science degree without the finance. It's just for those students who are a bit more advanced and they just need a little bit more to do. Um, one of the biggest mistakes students can make is see that word finance and go, oh, great. I didn't get into the school of business, so I guess I'll do actuarial science and finance because that's finances and more. So I'll just do, I'll just kind of do like a backdoor finance degree. Pretty much the worst decision they could make because there's a whole lot of math before you can get to the, to the actual finance part. So, um, so that's one, one you know, we, we try to wave a lot of flags for students who are trying to do that. So those are degrees that will take you by the hand and lead you more toward a profession. The other degrees, the applied math, 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 physics, math, stat, they're never going to take your hand and say, come with me and I'll lead you to this career. But they will always be by your side whenever you want to get a career. And they're going to hold you up and say, yes, this person is capable. This person can do this job. So let's start, let's start. Yeah, I'm gonna go a little bit out of order here. Start with just standard mathematics and, and applied math. So those are the two main um, halves of this next circle. It's applied math and we have pure math. Pure math is, it is the, this, the, the theoretical abstract proof-based beauty of math type of math. Okay, you're, you're trying to prove what is true, prove why calculus works and it's those long drawn out proofs you may have seen maybe in, in, in high school in geometry. This is a path for students who want to go into education, they want to go into research and math, they want to go to get their, their PhD, um, that type of, that type of, uh, of, 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 of path, okay? And then there's applied math. Applied math is more computational, it's more real world math. I want to go out and work right after I get a degree. I want to be a data analyst. I want to do a lot of these other things that are going to be talked about today. Um, so, that's what applied math is. It, it's that more solving a problem that exists in the world rather than proving, you know, just looking more at the abstract nature of math. Beyond those two main areas, so applied math can almost be chunked into a couple of more areas. So math physics, math stat. There, there's a lot of commonalities between, say, a math stat major and an applied math major who may take a couple of statistics courses. They're very similar paths. So math statistics is, is for students who, well, it, it's a very broad uh, degree that allows you to, you know, kind of put together your own, your own kind of major, but it has this statistics component to it. So if you really like math and you like statistics, it's a really good option for you. And the same thing for math physics. Math physics, it's a very small degree. There's very, very few students in this degree because typically it can hold students back. This, this degree really is intended for students who want to specifically go assist with research in a physics lab. They love math, they love physics. They don't necessarily want to go to graduate school for either of those and they just want to go work in that environment. It's a wonderful degree for those students. Um, so those are generally the ideas. These are very broad strokes. What I will say is someone who gets a degree in applied math can absolutely go to graduate school for math. They can do research in math. Someone who gets a math stat degree can do the exact same thing. So Again, these are, these are more of the classic CLAS, liberal arts and sciences degrees that will be there to support you. Actual science is one that will basically more direct you to a career. So that's the general overview of the math majors. And now uh, Lisa and Aaron are gonna take over and talk about the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the next thing that you can do to enhance your, your degree to some of these, you know, these uh, internship experiences and these co-op experiences, which are really gonna go a long way to help you reach that next step. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe, for, for that transition. Uh, I really appreciate your insight on all the different majors because there, there are so many. Like you said, it's a unique CLIS department. Um, and I, I, even in the Career Center, get some questions sometimes about how the different majors can apply to careers. So um, definitely something that I think is important to bring up. Um, so I'm going to take it from here and start to talk a little bit about experiential learning, because in my opinion, um, experiential learning is one of the best ways out there to really help you decide whether or not a certain career field is for you. Um, and while I'm going through this section, I really just want to encourage um, you to ask any questions that you have. So I do have the chat pulled up um, for the, the Zoom call. Feel free to type in any questions. We will have time for Q&A at the end. But if you have like a specific question about something I'm going over, please feel free to, to submit it via the chat. All right, so first things first, what exactly is experiential learning? Um, it's a very broad term, so I want to just be a little bit more um, intentional about the definition. Um, like I just mentioned, experiential learning is one of the best ways to get yourself what we call career ready and determine if a career is a good fit. So career ready essentially means um, getting you the skills and the experiences that you need to be successful in a certain career. Um, through experiential learning, students can learn about their chosen industry and job functions that will help guide their career path in the future. Um, so there's kind of two sides to this. Sometimes an experiential learning opportunity can help you learn that you absolutely love a certain field and you do really want to pursue something related to that. Um, and on the other hand, sometimes it will show you something that you really don't like and you, you decide to kind of steer away from. So experiential learning can be helpful on both of those, those fronts. Um, Oftentimes, experiential learning can lead to a full-time position with the same company or organization. Um, so that's another really huge benefit of participating in experiential learning. Um, I know personally many students who have done an internship with a company maybe between their junior and senior year and then gotten a job offer from them um, to, to pursue post-grad. So that's if you need another reason to think about an internship or, or experiential learning, that's definitely one of them. And even if that doesn't happen, it does look great on your resume overall. And common examples of experiential learning, you've probably heard a lot of these, these before, include research or REUs, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second, internships, co-ops, part-time jobs, volunteering, clinicals, and more. Um, so I'm going to dive into a little bit more detail about what I would say are the two most common experiences that math majors um, participate in, which are research and internships. And then I will um, talk a little bit more about some of these other, other categories as well, but I want to make sure we really focus on those two that I would, I would consider to be the most common. All right, so when it comes to um, research and internships, I would say that some of the most common questions I get are, what are my options? What does sort of the timeline and the process um, look like for those? And what are some of the search strategies for, for those? So those are the three questions that I'm going to attempt to answer over the next couple of slides. So starting with research, what are the options? Well, there are kind of these three different realms that research takes place in. Um, the first of which is through a very like structured um, national program called REUs, which stands for Research Experiences for Undergraduates. Um, this is a program that was uh, sort of like initiated by the National Science Foundation um, as an opportunity for undergraduate students to gain experience with research and then hopefully lead to jobs or other research experiences after the fact. Um, the, the National Science Foundation does directly sponsor still today many REU experiences. However, the program has grown even larger than that to, to um, like separate experiences as well. So the term REUs is a pretty widespread term at this point. And if you like Google REU, for example, you'll find a lot of different resources that are listed under like an REU category. Um, we do have REUs that take place at UConn as well as many, many other schools and even companies um, in, in the country. Speaking of schools and companies, um, the other two realms that research really most often takes place in is in the academic setting and in the, in the industry setting. So if you're doing academic research, you are most likely working at an academic institution, working with a faculty member or a graduate student um, in, a, in a college or university sponsored lab or project. Um, but if you're working on industry research, you're most likely working with a company, some sort of professional or excuse me, principal investigator who is a, an employee of that company. Um, and it, it usually takes place outside of academia. These three types of research are not mutually exclusive. There's, there's, there can often be overlap between um, all of them, but in general, those are some of kind of like the, the qualities of the different experiences. 
None of them are better than the others. None of them are more extensive necessarily than the others. It really just depends on the type of environment you're looking for, um, which, which environment might be best for you. So that's something you'll have to maybe look into and sort of compare different options that might be available to, to ultimately decide which, which option is the best for you. How do you do that? Well, uh, that brings me to some of the search strategies. So um, if you are interested in exploring a little bit more information about REUs, um, the National Science Foundation's website is a really good place to start with that. Um, we will be sharing a, a copy of these slides, so you'll have all these links after the presentation. But this first link here, number one, um, leads you to the REU directory on the National Science Foundation website. And I, the exact number is escaping me, but they have thousands of um, opportunities posted at any given point in time. So it's a really good way for you to explore those more like structured program style research experiences. If you are looking for um, experiences specifically at UConn, there are a lot of opportunities to, to explore those options as well. So the math department here at UConn has a really great section of their website that outlines all of the current research projects that are going on, which is really helpful. So you can not only see what topics are being covered, but you can also see what faculty members are working on the projects. Um, if the, the projects have led to any publications or presentations. Um, and if you want to get involved, all of the contact info and all of the context you need is directly on that website, which is awesome. Um, however, as a math student, you don't necessarily have to just be involved in, in research that's happening in the math department. So for example, if you are you know, really happy with your math stat major and you want to explore the stat side a little bit more, you can take a look at the stats department or you could take a look at maybe the econ department if you're looking at how your, um, your major can maybe be applied to like a more econ business fo focused career in the future. So definitely take a look at the math department website as an example, but know that you can also go to other departments websites as well. Um, underneath the math department here, we have a link to the Yukon Office of Undergraduate Research. So um, like the Center for Career Development is, is an office specifically designed to help you figure out like your career options. The Office of Undergraduate Research is specifically designed to help you pursue research opportunities. So if you um, are looking for like some extra support in this process, they have one-on-one -on -one appointments, they have workshops, they have kind of like a directory on their website as well of, of faculty who are like actively seeking um, research support from undergraduate students. So I would highly recommend taking a look at their, their site. They have such good programs and are super, super helpful. And then the third um, link on this, this slide under the Yukon section is a, a website called Linkist. Um, and this is actually a relatively new development. Um, it's, a, it's in like beta testing mode right now, but it's a website that um, it's kind of like a mapping system of all of the different research projects happening at UConn. And it shows you how they are related to one another. So essentially the way that it works is you log in, you have to log in with your net ID and you can in, enter a search term. So um, you could maybe use math. I would maybe encourage you to get a little bit more specific as, as like a certain type of um, research that you'd like to, to go into. So, you know, it could be um, biostatistics or geometry or something along those lines. And it will literally show you like a web of all of the different research projects that are happening, who's working on them and how they relate to one another. So if you are more so looking for a research project based on a certain subject or topic, um, Linkist is a really good way for you to get started with that because it is like a keyword based search term. So Again, if you're looking at UConn, lots of resources out there. I would say the more resources you use, the more options you're gonna find. So definitely kind of cast a wide net, especially if this is your first um, time thinking about a research project and kind of see where that, that takes you. Um, moving on to number three, another great way for you to get involved in a research project is to just directly reach out to a researcher. So if you happen to see, let's say like a UConn Today article or something in the Daily Digest that talks about a professor either at UConn or at another university who's doing a really cool project, you can just reach out to them and say, you know, hey, I saw your information here. This is what I'm interested in. Here's how I might be able to help. Um, is there a possibility for me to get involved in your, your research? Um, you'd be surprised at how often, as long as you show active commitment and um, professionalism, that those sort of opportunities will work out. So it can be a little intimidating and it might take you a couple of drafts to kind of perfect what that outreach actually looks like, but it's definitely something that can be successful. And that's something that we can help you with in the Center for Career Development in terms of like drafting that email or, or devising a strategy. And they can also help you with in the Office of Undergraduate Research as well. 
And then finally, um, I just want to bring up networking on this slide because networking is always a, a really effective way to find experiences as well. So if you are actively looking for research, it's a really good idea to let your um, faculty members know, to let your advisor know, to let um, any of your other like mentors or family members who are um, you, who you're often in touch with know because that way they have their ears open and they can maybe make any referrals or recommendations for you in terms of exp experiences or opportunities that they know about. So never underestimate the power of networking when it comes to searching for opportunities. So again, you'll, you'll have these links a little bit later um, to explore them further, but those are some of the um, research strategies, research search strategies that you have available to you. And then lastly, when it comes to research, I do wanna talk a little bit about the application process and timeline. Um, and really the, the answer to any question about these two topics is that it varies. Um, research is very um, different in many different companies, settings, educational institutions. And for that reason, the, the process of getting involved and even just the time frame of the project definitely varies across the board. So when it comes to applications, sometimes there is a very formal application process. Like for REUs, there does tend to be like a resume, um, sometimes like a, a statement of purpose or a personal statement, um, sometimes a cover letter. But if you are just kind of reaching out to one of your professors to say, you know, hey, can I get involved in your research? that doesn't really involve as much of a formal application process. Um, sometimes if you reach out to someone, they might say, maybe, but let me, let's sit down and have a conversation, almost like an interview. So you kind of have to be ready to, to be flexible with the application process because it is gonna be really different for the most part, regardless of the experience that you're, you're pursuing. Um, the one exception for that, I would say, is if you are applying to industry research. So let's say, for example, um, Boehringer Ingelheim, um, often referred to as BI, is one of, the really big recruiters we have here at UConn, and they have a lot of research internships at their company, and they do have a formal internship application, or excuse me, a, a research application process, because that is part of just how they operate. So again, it super, super varies. And then same thing with timelines, um, because some research projects are super short term, some of them are multiple year experiences, um, you might find projects that that line up with the academic year and sometimes you, you'll find projects that don't line up with the academic year. So keep that in mind as you're looking for a project if you only can commit one semester or if you want to commit multiple years that can maybe just help determine what types of projects that you get involved in. So that is is really the overview of research that um, we had prepared for today. If you have any questions about research about like your own personal interests and how those might tie to research or um, any any specific questions about like research you've tried to pursue in the past, again, definitely put those in the chat and I, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and in the, in the meantime, I will move on and start talking a little bit about internships, which I know we all often have a lot of questions about as well. So when it comes to internships, again, the, I think the biggest question I always get is what are my options? And I wanna start out by saying that math is such a broad field of study and you learn so many transferable skills from being a math major that you can intern in truly almost any industry. And I know that's probably not necessarily what you wanna hear and I promise we will talk more, um, Aaron's actually gonna talk a little bit more later about some of the common industries that math majors tend to pursue after graduation. So that can maybe inform some of the, the areas that you wanna look into for internships. But it, you truly have, I promise, the background and skills to intern in almost any industry. Um, however, caveat there, when you are looking for internships um, and you, if you type in the word math as a keyword for on like a job board website, for example, that is probably not going to bring up the most helpful list of uh, opportunities. Because in my experience, when um, I'm looking for positions that have the word math actually in the title, I almost always find like math tutor, math teacher, um, and, and generally things towards like the education realm. Um, however, if you think a little bit more specifically about what, what are some of like the tasks and um, responsibilities that you're looking for in an internship, that is where you can um, find better results, I guess I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, so for example, I have some, some suggestions here on the screen. If you really wanna do an internship that um, relates to data analysis or data science, you know, using those keywords are gonna be so much more successful in helping you find relevant results than just typing in the word math. 
Um, same thing, you know, you can type in coding, research, mentoring, patient care, depending on the different areas you're considering. Um, and, and those will definitely get you some more specific results. Um, similarly, you can also take a look at certain industries or professions. So if, you, if you're not sure exactly what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know you want to explore like the marketing industry or the financial services or teaching, you can use those um, keywords to find positions as well. So I, I feel like a fatal flaw in, in internship searches are just using your major as a keyword. And this is my, my uh, plea to have you be more specific and use a, more, a wider variety of keywords because that's what's really going to be most successful. Um, to really drive home the point, though, before I go any further about how math majors can intern in almost any industry, I actually went on to Handshake, which um, is one of our internship search resources that I'll talk about in a second, um, and screenshotted two random internships that I found to show you um, what I mean. So, for example, let's say you want to do try out an internship in marketing. If I look here at the qualifications for interning in marketing, um, it says I need a minimum of 3.2 GPA, pursuing an undergraduate degree, doesn't even specify what field, which is awesome. So that means any, anyone really can apply to this position. Um, I need to be interested in financial markets. I need to have problem solving and analytical skills, verbal and written communication skills, detail oriented, et cetera, et cetera. You can keep reading, but this sounds like pretty much a description of a math major to me. Um, so even though it's a marketing position, you definitely still have the skills as a math major to succeed in this role. And same thing down here for, um, this is a, a coding internship that I found, a summer coding internship. Um, and this specifically says, you know, we're looking for people with degrees in computer science, but also in IT, math, and engineering. So again, even though it's not specifically a math position, having that math background, you have all these skills that they are looking for here. You may need to learn some programming languages or at least um, actually, this is preferred qualification, so you don't even have to know all of these things, but, but that might benefit you in the long run. Um, but I just wanted to screenshot these two literally from this week. So these are like active internships. If you're interested, go apply um, to show you the, the variety of um, qualifications that you're, you're fit for. All right, so speaking of search strategies, um, these are the three most common strategies to find internships. Number one is using online job boards. And you'll notice that I have a little thing in parentheses there that says one out of 200. And that's because research shows that if you only use online job boards in your, your search for internships, you have, a, or, or really internships or jobs, you have about a one out of 200 chance of getting the position. So that doesn't necessarily mean you won't get an interview or you won't move along in the process, but to actually get the position, one out of 200. Um, jumping down to, I'll, I'll circle back to the details there, but jumping down to direct company outreach. So that would mean, you know, I really want to work for um, Pfizer. So I'm going to directly go to their website. I'm going to apply directly through their website. Um, and, and I'm going to build a relationship that way. You, because you went out of your way to be more intentional and more strategic in your communication, you now have about a one in 40% chance of getting that position. However, if you use a networking approach, and you build relationships with like individual people at Pfizer and you have, you know, let's say three or four people who already know your name when you're about to submit your application, you have about a one in 10% or one, one in 10 chance of getting the position. So I just wanted to include those numbers to show you how the likelihood increases with these more personalized methods of, of searching for an internship, because I often find that people make the mistake of only using online job boards. And it's kind of like, you're, you're only using one third of all of the possibilities to help you get a position. So the best internship search is going to involve all of these um, collectively, because that, you know, you don't want to just put all your eggs in one basket, you want to try to use as much variety as possible. So in terms of online job boards, what the ones that are linked here are some of the ones that I would like most highly recommend for students in your position. Um, Handshake is a UConn specific platform. So all of the positions on Handshake are specifically catered to UConn students and have been vetted by UConn, which is a really great benefit. Um, Indeed and LinkedIn are both uh, a nationwide search engine. So the, the quantity of jobs is going to be a lot higher on those. Um, but it might be a little bit overwhelming because there are so many. And then Going Global is a great resource for anyone who's looking for international positions. Um, they have a great international database from all countries around the world. And it's, it's, um, it's a great way to find international opportunities. The, the second line here specific, these are um, databases that are more geared towards a certain industry. So iCrunch data, for example, is specifically for jobs about 
that involve data. Um, the American Mathematical Society, those are more of those like straight math sort of positions. Analytic recruiting, analytical type jobs. Um, CTREAP is a teaching, like Connecticut teaching based positions. Um, there are a lot of these. So if, if you're looking for a job in a certain industry, you can Google like job boards in marketing, job boards in financial services and find more. But these are some of the like broader mass data related ones that I just wanted to include in this presentation as an example. And when you go on these sites, just as a reminder, get creative with your keywords. So don't just type math, don't just type internship, but be more specific and that will help you find the, the most number of positions that you possibly can. Um, I already talked a little bit about direct company outreach, but just as a reminder, this is if you know a company that you want to work for, or maybe you, you know your friend got an internship somewhere, or your family member recommended a company, go straight to their website. They almost always have like a careers page, and that's how you can see if they have anything open, and you can apply directly to the company. Um, when it comes to networking, utilize your personal network, similar to research, let everyone know that you're looking for an opportunity so they can make a referral for you. Um, but then also don't forget to utilize the Yukon network. Um, on the Husky Mentor Network, it, that's another Yukon specific resource where alumni have volunteered to create profiles and, and speak with current students. So if you don't currently have a Husky Mentor Network profile, definitely get on that. Um, and we're actually gonna do a demo a little bit later of how to use LinkedIn to, to find alumni in a certain field. So again, all great resources and the most effective strategy is going to be one that encompasses all of these. And the last thing I just want to mention about internships is the application and process and timeline. So typically for an internship, the application usually starts with an online submission of some kind. Um, usually you'll be asked to fill out some basic information like your name, your address, your educational background, et cetera. And then you'll usually ask to, to you're usually asked to upload a resume and a cover letter. If you ever want support with either of those documents, the Center for Career Development is happy to help you out with those. Um, after that, there's usually an interview. Um, the first round interview typically takes place maybe via phone. Nowadays, because video calls are so common, it might take place via video call. But the goal of the first round interview is to make sure that you can do the job, make sure you have the qualifications and the skills to be successful. Um, and then a lot of companies nowadays all also incorporate a second round interview. And if you get to the second round interview stage, that typically means that um, they already know that you can do the job, that you have the skills, but now they're looking to make sure that you're a good fit for the team and for the organization. Um, so just wanted to briefly go over this process. Again, this is a typical process. It's not necessarily what every company does. The size of the company will really depend on, will really impact this process as well, because if they have more staff, the interview process might be more extensive. If they have less staff, it might be less extensive. But in general, that, those, are, those are the typical steps. Um, internships can take place during the summer, fall, spring, or a combination. Um, it, it, really varies. I would say um, summer is most common, but now with, again, with the virtual setting being most common, fall and spring are, are go, uh, uh, becoming more and more common as well, and virtual internships are becoming more common. If you're interested, there are multiple ways at UConn that you can earn academic credit for an internship, so I did include a link about that if you're interested. I'm also happy to answer any questions about that if you have any. All right, and this is my last slide before I turn it over to Erin to talk about post-graduation, but just wanted to list one more time some other types of experiential learning that you can participate in. Um, volunteering and service is, of course, great if you're interested in more of like a humanitarian or helping type of career. Um, shadowing and clinicals are really common in healthcare, so if, you, if you're interested in taking your math background and going more into like a a uh, health related or medical related experience, those are really good to consider. Um, Co-ops are, for those of you who are not familiar, are um, six month long breaks from taking classes in order to work a full-time short-term position. Um, so it's essentially like having a full-time job for six months while you, you, you don't take a leave of absence, but you don't take courses and then you return as a student afterwards. Um, so if you are looking to really get like a full-time job type of experience before you graduate, a co-op is a really great option. Um, service learning happens through courses most often. Um, Part-time jobs, I'm sure you're all familiar with those, student organizations, there's, there's a lot at UConn, um, including the math club is, I would say, one of the most common ones I see that math majors are involved in. And then I do just want to mention competitions as well, whether it's a case competition, a hackathon, um, a sort of like conference 
style competition with a company, all of those experiences, even though they tend to be a little bit more short term, um, can also be really great ways for you to develop skills and add to your resume to really help build your credentialing for, for the future. So again, any questions about um, any of those, I'm happy, happy to answer. Um, but that kind of brings us to the end of the experiential learning section of the presentation. So at this point, I will turn it over to Erin and I will circle back later to answer any additional questions about experiential learning. Lisa, we do actually have a question in the chat if you just want to take a look at that. Yes. Um, all right. So I see the question is, do we have a Putnam team? I'm actually not familiar with what Putnam is. So let me look into that and I will get back to you. Erin, why don't you pick it up for now? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Lisa, for all that great information. Um, so I'm going to talk about post-grad options for math majors. I'm currently exploring these myself. So um, figure you hear it from someone who's going through it. Um, but so just as sort of to introduce us to um, some options, um, this is um, some data that the Center for Career Development has compiled um, on first destination when um, students have graduated uh, from the university. Um, classes of 2016 and 2019 is what is displayed in this graph. And so as you can see, we have um, five of the six math majors. We don't have enough um, information on math physics to include in this graph. As Joe mentioned, it's not a very populated major, um, but all the other ones are here listed on this graph. Um, as you can see, blue represents um, employed full time, orange is continuing education, and gray is other. Um, other can be going to the military, a part-time job, taking um, a gap semester, gap year, stuff like that. Um, volunteering, service learning, um, stuff like that Lisa just mentioned in that last slide. Um, so as Joe mentioned, um, actuarial science is very much directing you toward a career. Um, so that's why the actuarial science and actuarial science finance blue columns are shooting skyrocketing. I have the actual numbers that I can um, communicate with you all here. 69.1% of actuarial science majors were employed full time and 95.3% of actuarial science, made, actuarial science finance majors were employed full time. So definitely a great way to ensure that you have a job right out of college um, because you are literally going exactly into the field that your major is directing you to. Um, however, some actuarial science majors do choose to either do those other um, types of experiential learning or continue education with grad school. Maybe they wanna get a master's in statistics, mathematics. We'll go over um, different fields that math majors can enter into for grad school later. Um, and then for the different math majors, it really is just dependent on what people are interested in. Um, honestly, the thing that is most surprising to me here is that the mathematics um, major, so most people would say that you would want to go to grad school right after that for math because you're more interested in research. But a lot of people do um, are employed full time or pursuing other um, types of experiential learning. Um, so yeah, that is sort of what is going on in this graph. Um, but basically, the takeaway from this is that you really can do anything you want. It's just a matter of doing the research, searching what you want and submitting those applications. So next slide, please, Lisa. And then this chart right here, um, is the what employers rate as the essential need for what we define as the career readiness competencies. And so, as you can see, we have, I believe there's eight of them. And so what these all mean is that these are the skills that employers are looking for when they are um, hiring people. And a lot of these skills come with not only getting a CLES degree, but also getting a math degree. Um, most notably critical thinking and problem solving. If you aren't critically thinking or problem solving in your math major, what really are you doing? Um, so I definitely think that that is a super important thing. Um, Lisa, do you have anything else you'd like to mention about these competencies? Um, not, not really. I would just say that these, these come from surveying hundreds and thousands of employers. So across any industry, across any position, these are the top skills. So like I was saying earlier, when, when I say you're a math major, you have the skills to go into any field. This sort of reinforces that with critical thinking and problem solving being the number one skill. Great, thank you for that, Lisa. And here are some of the common industries that math majors tend to go into. By no means is this extensive, as Lisa keeps reiterating, and I will reiterate right here as well. Um, math majors can go into any field they want. We can do whatever we want, it's awesome. Um, but obviously there's academia and education, um, analytics and data science, something that I'm very interested in. Um, IT, computer information systems, business management, engineering, banking, insurance, law, it goes on forever. 
Um, so really whatever you're the most interested in, you can make the most of it, which is a really awesome thing um, about having a math major. Okay. So now some search strategies for the job market. It really does reflect and is quite similar to um, how you would find an internship. Um, all those great job boards, as well as reaching out um, personally one-on-one -on -one, um, is super important when searching for a full-time job. Um, one of the questions that we have fielded a lot is how can I search for a job during a pandemic? Obviously that's a big question on everyone's mind since we can't really see an end to the COVID-19 pandemic quite yet. Um, but now, it hasn't changed. You just need to make yourself stand out even more than before because that in-person experience isn't really going to be there. It's either going to be virtual through Zoom or WebEx, a platform like this, or over the phone, um, as well as some people might not even follow up. So it's really important that in your cover letters and your resumes, you are um, perfecting those so that you are really able to stand out. Um, and the Center for Career Development has lots of great opportunities for how to get um, information and help with those. And we also have a lot of great events um, that you can connect with employers. And um, we have, like Lisa mentioned, our Handshake website, which is employers that have, are specifically looking for UConn students, um, which is a really good opportunity because if you look on LinkedIn or Indeed, like Lisa mentioned, it's a lot more broad, um, which is a little overwhelming. I look, on, I look at jobs on LinkedIn all the time and I'm like, I have no clue what's going on, but it is really good to put yourself out there. Handshake is really ha handy. I really didn't mean to do that, but it just happened. Um, but yeah, and also our career fairs are an, another great opportunity, even if they are virtual, to connect with employers, get that personal one-on-one -on -one connection, um, and also use those people as references for when you're applying for these jobs. Okay, so that's the job market. If anyone has any questions about that, um, please feel free to send those questions in the chat um, or hold them off until the Q&A session at the end. Um, but now I'm going to speak a little bit more about what I'm more passionate about, which is grad school. So the basics about grad school, there are two paths you could take. You could get your master's, um, which can include a master of science, master of arts, master of the fine arts and um, business administration, or you could go for your doctorate, um, you know, PhD, MD, JD, medical degree, law degree, what, education, whatever you want. Um, and there are a lot of search engines to figure out what program is right for you. That's pretty much the first step um, after finding out what you want to do. Um, you can look on the American Mathematical Society, a uh, um, search engine that Lisa mentioned earlier, but also there are plenty of, if you literally look up grad school search engine in Google, so many come up as, um, and you can specify what field you're interested in going into, what location, what type of campus, what type of faculty. Um, it's all very personalized. And as long as you have somewhat of an idea, you'll be able to find a program that fits what you're looking for, whether you wanna write a thesis or not, a capstone project. I've looked through them all and it's very overwhelming, but when you are able to narrow it down to what you're the most interested in, it makes it a lot more um, tangible. Like you can reach those goals, which is really awesome. Um, and admissions requirements do tend to vary, um, but most things that are emphasized in um, the types of programs that math majors go into, um, academic abilities, so coursework that you've done, what you've learned at your time at UConn and other institutions you may have um, gotten degrees from, and your research experience. Um, I've also found, I'm currently in the middle of submitting applications myself, that um, letters of recommendation are super important. So I have asked uh, a couple of my professors to write me letters of rec, that is a super important thing to make those connections with your professors. Um, if you haven't done it yet, it's a great idea to start now. Um, they actually tend to remember you, which is really crazy. I think they have so many students. How can they remember one student that they had in their class that's like three semesters ago, but they remember, which is really, really awesome, especially if you make that one-on-one -on -one personal connection, which I keep saying, but it's just so important. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much how it works, but it does vary, like I said, across grad schools. So definitely be sure that you're checking out the, their websites and their info sessions and asking questions to their admission reps to make sure that you are doing exactly what you need. Also GRE, super important. Sometimes it can be waived, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic, which is awesome. I've already taken it though, so that doesn't really count for me, but for everyone else, um, it's a little expensive. So definitely if you can get that waived, I would recommend, but also a very important thing to take. Okay, so here are some common fields that math majors tend to go into for grad school. Once again, not an extensive list, um, but just some basic ones that we've seen. Um, math and applied math, if you want to delve deeper from your undergrad um, or want to sort of pinpoint a specific field 
of mathematics that you're interested in. That is a great way, grad school is a great way to um, fine tooth comb through all the different um, fields that math has, probability theory, um, abstract math, there's so many. It's very stressful, but that is a great way to do that. Um, and then you can also get your master's in teaching. Um, I'm pretty positive to be a college professor, you need at least a master's, if not a PhD. So if you're looking to do that, definitely look into that. Um, you can go into a master's in actuarial science if you want to once again delve deeper. Grad school is mainly um, meant for that deeper understanding of the field that you are hoping to get a career in. Um, or to show that you want to do research or you want to teach stuff like that. Um, of course, there's stats and biostats, econ, engineering. Um, and then there's all the technological coding stuff such as data science, analytics, computer science. And then there's um, further um, fields in accounting and business and stuff like that. So lots of things to choose from, but thankfully it's when you have at least an idea of what you're looking to do, um, those search engines will be super helpful. Um, I personally, looked at programs based off location, you can do it that way too. Um, and usually you will be able to find something that is aligned with what you are looking to do. Uh, we're looking to delve deeper into for the rest of your life, which is a little terrifying, but also pretty exciting. Um, so that's all about grad school, post-grad opportunities, the job market. If anyone has any questions about that, like, once, like I said, once again, feel free to send them in the chat or um, save them till later. And now what we're just gonna talk about is um, some math alumni that uh, we have looked up on LinkedIn, just to sort of talk about some specific paths that people have gone into, um, graduated from UConn and have either furthered their education, have full-time jobs, have done both, um, as well as do a demo on how to find these specific alumni because that is also a super um, beneficial tool to use when you're looking for a company to apply to. Maybe you can see if someone from UConn, is someone from UConn works there or, um, they were the same major as you, or they're going to a, they graduate from a program you're interested in. Um, so yeah, we'll be doing that very shortly. So Lisa, would you rather do the demo first or for me to talk about the alums first? Let's, let's go with the demo. Okay, let's go with the demo. So this is LinkedIn. I hope all of you have seen this before. Um, a great thing to do is to search up Yukon, as Lisa is doing. <laughs> And once it loads, what you can do is on this left sidebar, if you click alumni, anyone that has University of Connecticut in their education section will show up. As you can see, we currently have about 150,000 alumni that are on a link LinkedIn. And now what you can do is you can search by a specific company, keyword, title, major, um, anything, or you can go through as Lisa's doing right now to see um, what these alumni do, what they studied, what fields they're in, um, where they live, lots of great stuff like that. You can also change the start year and end year. It doesn't really matter if you're looking for younger alumni, maybe you want to do from 2015 to 2020 or um, older from 1990 or something like that, whatever um, is easiest for you all. Um, but yeah, so once you go through and sort of fine tooth comb, once again, what you are looking for to connect with an alumni, you can scroll down like Lisa has done here and look at all these people that pop up. So many people that are doing such great things and you can go onto their profiles and see what they've done. You can connect with them. If you are going to connect with people, I would 10 out of 10 recommend personalizing a message to send to them. By no means, if you don't know a person and you're just clicking connect, people are gonna be like, why is this random person connecting with me? Um, so yes, definitely add a note to say, hi, Hi Chance, I noticed your profile on the UConn alum page on LinkedIn and I was interested in connecting with you. Um, please reach out to me. And if he does it, then that's great. And you have a connection and you can engage in conversation with him to sort of find out more about what he does and what his path was and how he got there and see if there's anything that he can help you with, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I actually used this exact resource to get the alumni that I'm about to talk about. Um, so yeah, we have, I'm gonna count six, six alumni here that have very different paths, all from a different um, math major. Um, I think we got, if not all the six, four out of the six, something like that. Um, so first we have Todd and Todd is um, an actual, he was an actuarial science major. He founded his own company. So I'm sure at some point he did some actuarial work. 
Um, but then he decided that that wasn't enough for him and he became an entrepreneur and founded his own company. Um, so that is a very tangible thing that anyone here can do. If you have an idea and a math major, because you have those awesome transferable skills that we learn as a CLAS students, um, you can pursue that. We also have Isabella Santos, who is an applied, was an applied math major. She is currently a math fellow. I honestly have no clue what that means, but it sounds really cool. And obviously she's doing great because she's a fellow in math. Lisa, if you have any idea what that is, I would love to know, <laughs> as I'm sure everyone else would as well. Yeah, so generally a fellow tends to have something to do with research. So I would guess that Isabella is at some company or school that's helping um, some sort of math related research project. Amazing, great for her and great for any of you that wanna be a math fellow. Um, then we have Abia Jaffrey and she is also, a, was also an applied math major. She is currently a master of science student at Brown University for biomedical engineering. So even though she started off as an applied math major at UConn, um, she decided that she wanted to take her career a little bit differently and decided to pursue a master's in BME. And that is definitely something that anyone here can do, um, any type of engineering, like we mentioned in one of the previous slides. So that's awesome for her. Um, and and then we have Elise Earls. She was a pure math major. Um, she got her undergrad in mathematics, pursued a master's in education, and is now an interim principal. So if people are interested, maybe not in teaching, but in school administration, a math major is another great um, resource to have um, to do that, which is awesome. And then we have Anthony Sisti. I'm so sorry if I'm butchering that. Um, he was a math stat major. He is currently a PhD student at Brown University. I don't know how I found two Brown University people off this thing, but hey, whatever works. And he's pursuing um, a degree in biostatistics. So once again, um, started in math, went a little bit different route, but still those transferable skills and that basic foundation that is super important um, has allowed him to now almost be a doctor, which is awesome. And then lastly, we have Alex Wheeler, who is also a math stat major, and he is an IT project manager. And once again, have no clue what that really entails, but he has obviously found a career that has not only allowed him to manage other people, but do something that he's probably very passionate about. Um, Lisa, if you have anything else to add about that. Um, no, I think you, think you hit it on the head there. Um, I know a lot of math students do tend to like to go into like the tech sort of field, but, and this is definitely one option to do that. Yeah, so these are just, literal drops in the barrel of the numerous alums that you can all connect with um, and also just see different paths that you can take from these people that did what we are currently doing. So it's a very great resource and also just makes it a little more realistic instead of like some far off crazy thing that no one can ever attain. These people have done it and so we can do it too, which is great. That's such a good way to put it, Erin. Thank, thank you for kind of leaving it on that note. Um, which is, I think, a perfect transition into just really quickly, we have two last slides here um, with just additional resources. So this slide, um, slide 25 here, has some resources within the Center for Career Development here at UConn. So if after today's presentation you want to schedule an appointment, um, we've linked Handshake here. You can also use that to look up um, internship opportunities. We've got the Husky Mentor Network to connect with alumni. Um, some research resources, our events calendar. So definitely take a look at all of these. Um, we've also listed some of the other um, the other resources we use throughout the presentation, so the math department, math REUs, Office of Undergraduate Research, National Science Foundation, and then these last two links are just some other like sort of crowdsourced um, resources about um, math professional associations and careers that involve math. So just like someone else's perspective, feel free to go ahead and, and take a look at those as well. Um, but we do want to spend the last five minutes or so um, answering any questions that you have. I will put the link to the, the slides in the chat so that you can have them um, now. And after today's presentation, you have mine and Erin's email address if you have any questions for us here on the slide. Um, but does anybody have any questions that we can answer for you now in the moment? And or Erin, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? I think we pretty much covered it all, but yeah, please feel free to reach out. I'm literally going through the same thing you all are going through. So more than happy to talk about the struggles of being a math major. <laughs> Hi, could you guys go into a little bit more uh, in depth about the, the Husky Mentor Network? Uh, is it something where you're, um, it's like a little more in depth with one person or is it you, you just talk to a bunch of different people? Like how does it work with, with that? Yeah, 
great question. So I can I can start with that. And Erin, if you have anything to add, feel free to jump in. But it um, it is really in depth um, one on one interaction. So essentially, when you log in, you will have a directory of advisors. They're called. That's the term that Husky Mentor Network uses. And you can go through and use different keywords. So you can you can search specifically for people who were math majors, specifically for people who are in a certain industry. And then it'll show you a list of results. And then you can go through and choose from that list who you want to speak to. And then you'll actually like schedule a date and time to speak with them. And I think that the standard time for an appointment is about 30 minutes. So you'll have 30 minutes to ask them questions, get to know them. Um, you know, you can even hopefully build a relationship and maybe take it off the platform and, you know, stay in touch via email or LinkedIn. But it really is meant to have those like deep dive sort of informational interview style um, conversations. So um, if you have any other specific questions, feel free to let me know. But that's kind of the gist of how that works. That was great. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? All right, I'm gonna take that silence as probably a no. Um, so I guess I will just kind of conclude by saying that thank you so much for being here. I hope that this presentation was helpful as really like a, um, a starting point to help you kind of think about some options that you might want to look into further or pursue further. Um, you know, we our goal today wasn't necessarily to help you figure out exactly what you want to do with your math degree, but at least give you some options to kind of look into so that way you can um, make your own more educated decision in the future. So um, definitely feel free to touch base with us again, us again in the future um, if you do some more research or have some more questions about any of this this content. Erin, do you have a, a final thought for us as well? I think the only other thing I just say is that um, this recording, we were recording this session, we will be sending it out, um, not only to you all that attended, everyone that registered, as well as math majors as a whole. Um, so you can definitely refer back to this as well as the slides if you have um, any other questions or just wanna look over something again. Um, so yeah, and you'll be able to click all those links which are super helpful as well. So that's pretty much it. Awesome. Well, we will wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Erin, for co-presenting and for Joe, who had to leave us a little bit early. Um, but we hope that everyone has a great rest of your day and we hope to stay in touch with you in the future. Thanks again for joining us. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.